Hello and welcome to another episode of the Firearms Insider Gun and Gear Review Podcast. This is episode 70. On this show, we showcase gun reviews, gear, and anything else a gun enthusiast may be looking for. We strive to evaluate products from an unbiased and honest perspective. I'm your host, Ryan Cross, in the Firearms Radio Network, your source for broadcasts for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts. Today I have with me listener Chad Wallace. Thanks for joining me this week, Chad. Yep. I'm glad to be here. It's so, uh, always a you, fun time. Did you do any shooting this week or anything gun-related? I did. I did. I actually went yesterday, and it was just beautiful. Uh, as some people might know, I've been trying to work up a load for one of my... I think I finally found one that it seems to like, so I'm shooting under an inch at 100, so... What, what caliber are you working a load up for? It's 5.56, five, five, and it shot best with the 68 grain uh, Hornadies that I was shooting. Mm-hmm. What, what, uh, what powder are you using? Actually, I was using 4064 IMR mm-hmm. because it's readily available here. Sometimes so, that's the most important thing, is if you can find it so you can repeat your load. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, uh, what's common? Because otherwise I would have used like Vargit or something because I've had really good luck with it continually yeah. in about everything I've loaded it in. Yeah, there's a there's a pretty good supply of Hodgden powder up here. So, you know, whenever I see H335, um, 331, or... Pff, I mean, anything, or was it 332? I don't know. Uh, I, I get it, or Varget. I just get it. I don't care if it's $30 a pound. I just, you know, get it so I have at least two bottles on hand to last me. Um, I did a little bit of load developing myself yeah. with the uh, 300 wood mag. Um, it would be IMR. F- um, God, you know, I can't pull it off the top of my head. It's the maroon colored. It's uh, 4895. No, it's uh, forty three fifty. That's it. I'm okay, our forty three yeah. forty three fifty, and then uh, experimenting with just different uh, weights to see what that one in ten barrel uh, shoots best. I'm not really looking for punching paper, um, although I'm looking for at least trying to do like a sub MOA cartridge that I or bullet that I know is gonna be effective on game. So I'm looking at like. Uh, Sierra Game Kings, some burgers, uh, VLDs, and then some of the Nosler Acubond um, and partitions. So just you know, taking all those variables and just starting one at a time. Um, other than that, though, it's been a great week. Uh, first week of starting my business, and uh, the outreach has been great as far as a lot of uh, friends uh, in the podcasting community as well as family have been, oh, hey, I've got a job for you. You know, let's let's get this going. So, I've been really busy. Um, haven't actually been able to play with my any of my guns this week necessarily. So, but uh, busy's good. Got to have ammo money if I hope to go to the range uh, anymore. So let's yeah. get uh, let's get right into the announcements. Of course, guests are always welcome on the show. So if you want to join the show to just talk shop and. Uh, talk um, about the new products that we bring up on the show, or if you want to review one of your own favorite guns or gear items, uh, just shoot me an email and we'll get that set up. So it's cross at firearmsradio.tv and uh, we'll talk at shop and uh, we'll figure out how that's going to work best for you. Um, also, we're still doing that Facebook like giveaway. Uh, we're almost at 500 likes on the Firearms Insider Facebook page. So uh, I think we're only about like maybe. 15 or 20 likes away last time I checked. So as soon as uh, we hit 500 likes, I'm going to be giving away two swag packages to two very lucky Facebook fans. Um, Those packages contain items that I've procured from SHOT Show 2015. So we're looking at, you know, some hats, some patches, some stickers, some extra little goodies. Um, I'm even throwing in there um, some extras that I have or just some extra goodies that um, I didn't pick up from SHOT Show, but I know people are going to like um, I've got some uh, some AR-500 steel samples that I'm able to fit inside a, uh, a postal box, so uh, it'll be interesting. So hopefully uh, 
by the end of the month, uh, I'll be able to announce those winners on the network or on the podcast and send those packages out. Um, so let's get right into the new product spotlight. In this episode, we're, I'm kind of focusing on just new uh, guns that are primarily polymer as far as their construction and furniture. I'm just kind of a theme. So uh, right out the gate, I wanted to talk about Caltex uh, Sub 2000. They have a Gen 2 coming out. Um, so they made some uh, dr dramatic improvements to the Gen 1 Sub 2000. Uh, t I'm sorry, uh, Chad. Have you uh, ever held or, or looked at or shot a, a Caltex Sub 2K at all? Uh, I've held them at gun shows, but I've never actually shot one. Uh, they always look like they'd be a lot of fun. Something you could throw in the truck and just kind of keep there just because. Yeah, there's a huge uh, fan following for like preppers and like you said, people that just want it as a good truck gun. And the fact that it takes the same pistol magazines as um, you know, you can ha get the Glock version or the uh, the Beretta 92 version. So uh, there is some kind of quirks with the the platform, the the first one that some people kind of didn't like, and and um, they've actually come up with a Gen 2 that addressed some of those main concerns. I've had two. I've had a, a 40, and I've had one in a 9. And they're both uh, Glock models. Obviously, I don't have either one anymore. Um, because I just, you know, found favor with other firearms, and I didn't really like how it felt like a toy, um, you know, as far as all the plastic components. Now, this Gen 2, I'm actually excited for, um, because there's some additions on there that I would actually like to try out, and um, possibly could change my whole mind on the Sub 2000, as far as whether it's uh, good at all. Did you happen to see one when you were shot? I wanted to swing by, but uh, I didn't get a chance to. Uh, okay. I did kind of, I did do like a, a, I guess like a drive-by when I was walking past it in uh, at media day, watching people shoot it. So um, the first big modification that they've made to it um, is the front sight. It's, I think it was Lex Lexicon or or Lexan that um, kind of glass plastic material. The front sight was just a bright red plastic piece inside of a plastic housing that was affixed to the barrel like with some sort of just gunk. Um, it wasn't like machined to the barrel necessarily. It was just stuck on there with friction and almost like thread locker. Um, you know, and so if you wanted to install an aftermarket sight, which a lot of people did, they'd get like a red lion front sight, you had to uh, like either cut it off or take like a, a blowtorch and kind of melt that gunk off and, and work it off the barrel, um, you know, to put the new one on that would actually had machine screws. Uh, so they've actually readdressed that. It's got uh, what looks like a, a metal front sight, and it uses AR-15 sight posts. So that's a huge uh, benefit that they've already added to there because, um, you know, just that, that front sight, Aligning that sight picture, you get the the rear aperture, and then that that plastic piece. Ugh, it was it was awful. So now you actually can use your favorite AR-15 sight post, or you know a, a thicker diameter one, a thinner one, or a, any of the uh, fiber optic or tritium ones you want. The other nice thing is, you can actually take the front sight off and it reveals a threaded barrel. So I just got a text from Arturo saying it, it still doesn't come with the threaded barrel. You're actually wrong, buddy. You can take off the front sight, and then it reveals threads, uh, and it's the, um, the AR-15 pattern thread, So or whatever most common 9mm, I think it's the same, it's the one half by... 36 or something, or yeah. 28, or I guess it depends on which one it is. Yeah, so you can put your 40 or your 9mm suppressor on there, or if you want a flash hider or a compensator, you can put that on there as well. Um, so I'm not sure how. I was trying to look at the. I was watching some videos, like Hank Strange did a, uh, a video at the Keltec booth at Media Day, and uh, I, I'm not really seeing how it, like, when you take that front sight off, if it, like, locks when you collapse it. Because I know the Gen 1 the front sight interfaced with the buttstock, 
And so that's how it, there was kind of like a plastic ball detent that locked it together. So if you take that front sight base off, I don't know if it still locks together or whether it folds in half and it is, is not really nothing holding it in that position. Um, the buttstock's been changed up a little bit. It's still a plastic buttstock, but now it's uh, adjustable. It's not like on the fly adjustment, but you can, there's like a push pin that you can adjust it. Like I think the range for adjustment is like an, an inch and a half, inch and a quarter. Um, so you can do that to adjust your length of pull if uh, that makes a big difference to you. Uh, it looks like it might come with a uh, kind of a, a better, more ergonomic charging handle. And, and I say charging handle because it's you've got the tube of the Sum 2000 and then you've got like almost like a, uh, a novelty size thumbtack shape. You know, it's kind of got like a wider base and then it tapers in the middle and then it gets bigger at the top. And so that's where you can wrap your finger around and then rack the the, the chamber. Um, the other improvements I see is they, uh, the receiver, they've actually updated the mold for that. So a lot of people were complaining that the Sub-2000 was like the overpriced unicorn of the gun industry. Like it was uh, over, overpriced, you know, the MSRP was only like $350, somewhere around there. Uh, but people were, you know, it was so hard to get and people wanted them so bad, and it seems like Caltech was like barely putting out any. Um, and the reason for that, one of the reasons that they've actually corrected is that the mold for the receiver, uh, there was a lot of extra processing that went into that before it was ready to go out onto the shelf as far as trimming that plastic and some other processes that uh, just wasn't very efficient. So they redesigned that it's still a plastic receiver, um, but they've redesigned it so it's faster to produce, not a lot of trimming involved. Um, and then some people also complain that when you took a magazine and you put it inside the, the, the grip, that uh, the grip kind of the seams kind of widened a little bit. And so that they've also um, made adjustments to that design so that it stays, uh, the sh it doesn't expand when you put in a magazine. That was something minor, but I did notice that as well, and that's kind of also why I had got rid of the two I had before because I was like really I put the magazine in and it kind of swells the grip like that's kind of lame so they've they've addressed that and fixed that uh, the other thing that they've done is uh, they've got this gator uh, grip texture that they've got on their their PMR 30 pistol and some of their other pistols they've applied that to this firearm as well and so that that grip pattern it's just kind of scales like square scales like an alligator it's on the grip handle, and it's also at the base of the handguard or the forend, uh, you would say. And it's interesting, the forend, it's, it's kind of a hybrid. Like at the first maybe three, four inches of it, it's got that gator pattern, and it's kind of thicker, and it kind of tapers down. And then it turns into a Picatinny rail on the top and bottom. And then on the sides, it's got M-lock slots for the Magpul M-lock accessories. Um... So that's kind of the uh, all the the, mod the additions that they brought to the Gen 2. There's also some a bit of Picatinny rail at the bottom of the butt um, the butt stock. Um, you know, I don't know what you'd want to put there. I guess sling mounting accessories like a a QD sling adapter or a Magpul sling um, loop. I guess if you wanted to put that there, you wouldn't put a monopod there. I don't think. <laughs> I don't think on that gun you'd put a monopod on it. No. Uh, yeah, and I, you, on the fore end above where the grip is, even though it has M-lock, it looks like it has a rail on the top and bottom. Yes. I didn't know if you mentioned that or not. Yeah, the, uh, the Picatinny rail. I don't know. I'd be interested to try one of these out. I mean, it looks kind of interesting. It looks, It actually looks a little more comfortable to shoot than the last version that I picked up once. Yeah, I mean, I would, if I saw this in the store, I would have to pick it up just to, to see if it is any feels any better. If it doesn't feel like a toy, I mean, there's polymer rifles out there that do not feel like uh, toys at all. You know, the, uh, the Tavor, the AUG, uh, the MDR, um, you know, there's a lot out there that I mean, made a polymer, but don't feel kind of cheap. And I, I, I got that feeling whenever I was playing with them before. So hopefully now, 
Um, there's also, uh, when I was watching the Hank Strange video, he mentioned that, you know, the sloppy, gritty trigger of the original, if they've kind of fixed that at all, and they haven't done a thing to the trigger, but because they kind of redesigned the mold of the receiver, that kind of took a lot of the slop out of the trigger, and so it's a little bit crisper. It's not really lighter at all. It's just the travel is a little smoother. So if you've shot one and that uh, trigger pull brings back uh, nightmares, I uh, just wanted to let you know that they've improved that as well. So, Well, at least, you know, it resets, unlike the R51 or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, and they so also... They're, they're doing something. Yeah, and they're they also enlarged... Like I know they enlarged the ejection port too, like by forty percent. Um, just I don't. I've never really had. I think I might have one stove pipe with with dirty ammo, but uh, they've enlarged that to accommodate for um, clearances. You know, if you're you're shooting a, a a lot in a weird position or whatever, you don't have a a round that gets hung up in the uh, in the chamber or in the action. Yeah, from the so, picture, it looks super huge. Like you could fit like. I don't know, your whole hand in there is kind of what it looks like, even though I know that's not true. Yeah, at first I was like, is that is that a 50 cal sub-2000 <laughs> or a 45 ACP? That'd be cool. That would but, be cool. Uh, yeah, no, they just enlarge it. Dude, if they make this in 45, bam, I'm going to get one. It's over. That would be a sweet truck gun right there. Um, or but 10. still, the, blinking with the 9 is fun too. Yeah, or in 10 millimeter. Oh, come on. <laughs> You okay. big tease. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, they don't have anything on the new Sub-2000 on their website quite yet. They've still got all the old pictures of the older versions. Uh, so, if you want to see pictures, you got to Google it. you got to go to some of the other blogs that were at SHOT Show that got coverage. So, i got a link in the show notes for the firearms blog. They've got a pretty nice coverage of the new Sub-2000 if you want to check that out. they got up-close pictures of the front sight post and front sight based. Um, how It looks like, actually, the, uh, the stock interfaces with the front sight. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to lock up or not, but they've got some, some kind of detailed pictures for you to look at over at the firearm blog. Um, I, did do, I did also hear rumors that they're going to be coming out with the different colors. I think they had OD Green and Flat Dark Earth. Um, you know, it's always like good luck finding them, but um, you know they are going to be producing them in the colors. And then I also heard that they were going to try different magazine uh, types. So you got your Glock, and is the I think the, the Glock 17 is going to be coming out first. And then they'll come out with one that accepts Glock 19, so the the grip is a little bit shorter to take those 15 round magazines. Of course, it'll still take 17s and and 33s. Um, and then I think, though well, obviously they'll do Beretta, but I heard rumors of a Springfield XD version and a Smith & Wesson m and version as well. So uh, people that don't own Glocks and don't have Glock magazines, first of all, shame on you. Second of all, uh, if you're really interested in this, they might release a model in the future that caters to the magazines that you do have if you're an XD guy. Um, so just putting that out there. It's it's all rumor mill, though, so do not quote me on that. So next up, we've actually got uh, something from Mossberg that uh, uh, I'm, I'm still not sure on. But in, uh, in good fashion, I'm going to tell you about it first, and then you can make your own decision before I impart any of my, uh, any of my own opinion on it. So Mossberg has come out with a... A rifle. It looks to be a stab at the uh, the 1022 almost. It's just a very small youth-sized uh, rifle, and they call it the Blaze. So it's Mossberg's uh, newest Rimfire Autoloader series. It looks to be some modularity um, and some some different stock options as far as it looks like it's got a black synthetic stock, but you can also get it in. Muddy Girl Camo, uh, Wildfire Camo, um, Cryptic, Highlander, and then they also have one that's uh, they call the Bantam. And I think that one, I can't tell what's different about that. Oh, Shorter Barrel, maybe? Uh, so basically, it's a 
easy handling rifle that has a polymer receiver, comes in the different finishes, uh, a, your choice of adjustable rifle sights, a top rail, uh, or a rail with a green dot sight. Um, and so yeah, the Banta model is a reduced 12 inch length of pole which is kind of more suited for youth uh, or a starting rifle for someone that's younger or, sh or smaller framed. The barrels are 16 and a quarter inches, they're blued, and it comes with a 25 or 10 round magazine. Uh, so I've got a picture of the Blaze rifle. That's not really what we're focusing on today, but you got to kind of look at the picture here of the Blaze to kind of understand. Um, so then as I flip this uh, catalog over, today we're going to be talking about the Blaze 47. So it basically they took the Blaze and they've dropped into a furniture kit that makes it look like an AK-47. So I haven't seen a lot of 22 caliber AK-47 replicas or out on the market. Um, so it looks like this might be filling a hole that wasn't really there. Maybe I'm unaware. I'm sure somebody will text me or email me saying that uh, you know, there was a AK-47 in 22 that I've never heard of. Um, have you? So you've taken a look at these, Chad, and I'm sure that you've shot in an AK-47 once in your lifetime. So yeah, once or twice. You should be able to. Yeah. So what do you what do you think about this? Well, my actual thing is is this looks like a poor copy of an AK-47. I mean, I understand the modular design and how some people are gonna like that it kind of looks like an AK-47, but, you know, it's got some pluses. You know, it's got an adjustable buttstock. It doesn't have the AK true safety. It's got just a regular lever safety on it, like most things. So, you know, that's a plus. You know, it's probably, it weighs four and a half pounds, so it's, it's not super heavy. You know, it's, you know, the standard, kind of like all the other specs of the Blaze, it's a 16 and a half inch barrel, you can get a 10 round or 25 round magazine. Uh, it's just, I, you know, I don't even know if the ergonomics would be the same as the AK, actually. Uh, so, I, it just doesn't really do anything for me. Right. Um, so, it looks like you'll be able to get it with a, a, a synthetic adjustable stock or in um, just a wood stock, you know, and that's also the synthetic has a, uh, a polymer handguard and the wood has a wooden handguard. But uh, I'm not really so sure. I mean, I guess I'd have to look at it, but it feels like, you no, know, ha having owning an AK and shot some AKs, I don't know if I have an interest in, I, I may be interested in shooting a 22 caliber AK. Let's just say that first. But looking at these, I'm not sure it's going to sell me on it. I think it might actually turn me off to the whole concept. But that's just from looking at it. I can't make any um, any objective statements because I've never held one or seen one in real life. I'm just looking at a 2D picture here. So um, actually, I see. I forgot to mention the MSRP on that uh, Keltec Sub 2000 is uh, about $500. Um, but I actually wanted to mention, that reminded me to, um, because I was looking at the MSRP of these Blaze 47 rifles, and it looks to be uh, $329. Now that's um, that's what an AK should cost you, um, actually. <laughs> but it, of course, AKs nowadays, because the whole bands and it's a scary black rifle, you can fetch them for $500 or $600, or if they're much nicer, even higher. So getting something like this, for under 400, I'm assuming street price is going to come in at 300 or under 300. You know that's not bad. Um, you know if if you're an AK fan and you're getting your kid into shooting, it's a it's a big leap to get have your kids start on a 10.22 and then hand them an AK. You know when you feel like they're confident. This is kind of uh, almost like a, an AK training model. You know you can start your kid off on this and they can. While they won't get the exact controls of an AK because obviously the selector isn't there, I mean the uh, the safety uh, lever isn't there, but it's it's close, you know. 
It's it's for the Call of Duty kids. Yeah, I wasn't gonna say that, but I'm glad you did. Um, <laughs> I sure put it on me. Yeah, the uh, the barrel, the twist rate is one in sixteen. Um, you know, twenty two long rifle. Uh, you've got different kinds of sight options. Um, you like a dead ringer, green dot slash rail, or just a uh, a barrel mounted rail. So. You know, something you can slap a red dot on, and uh, you know, let your take your kids to the range and let them shoot it. Um, it's a lot less weight than a AR-15 that's chambered in 22 long rifle, or if it's you know your AR-15 that you dropped a uh, 22 conversion bolt in, um, it's you're still going to be lighter there, um, so it might be easier for them to hold and to shoot. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that. I'm interested to see kids shooting it. I'm not interested to see, you know, fully grown men shoot it, that's for sure. Yeah, and that's probably their target market, too. I mean, you and I probably are not the target market for a AK lookalike 22 long rifle. Well, I could if it was more like an AK, if it actually <laughs> had the same selector. I mean, I would be interested in one if, because, I mean, 762 by 39, it's. It's cheaper than some uh, ammunitions out there uh, if you get the right military surplus. But 22 long rifle, I mean, if it's I cool. had some, not saying I do or I don't, don't come to my door because you'll, be you'll be greeted unwelcomely. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a lower recoil option. It's better, easier on the ears. It's easier on the kids. Um, you know, I just, it, it's a range toy. I mean, you're not going to be uh, teaching the kid to hunt squirrels or rabbits with it necessarily. Um, it's really just for cosmetics, and I don't know. I think I've I've seen AK-47 airsoft guns that looked better than this. Um, that might be a little harsh, but uh, I, I guess I just really have to see it in, in function. Um, so you might be asking yourself, well, how do you take the Blaze rifle that's kind of like a 1022? and make it look like an AK. Uh, well, it looks like it's got plastic, a plastic front sight that goes over the barrel. Um, that's like your AK-47 front sight post. Uh, and then it's got like a, looks like a mock gas tube that also goes down around the barrel. It's made out of plastic. It does have a sling loop from there, so that would be like where the bayonet lug would be uh, traditionally. Um, yeah, it is you know, do, is the whole thing like encased is in like a polymer? They like take the action and then encased in like a polymer AK shell. Is that's that what, it, what I'm that's at? that's what it's looking like. Like it looks like a Tapco or an ATI stock. Um, it looks like something I would yell at somebody for putting on their AK. Um, I'd say <laughs> take that off, put the wood furniture back on. But they do have this Blaze 47 in wood furniture, and I agree with you that that looks much better aesthetically. Um, but maybe if you're having your kid use this, you want the synthetic adjustable stock for the shorter length of pull. That's the only thing I can really think of. So, yeah, for uh, for 327 bucks or 329 MSRP, probably looking at 300 street price. Uh, it ain't, it's not bad, you know. I, I think that there's going to be a market for it. It won't be all of us. It just might be some of us with, with kids um, or wives, you know, so the wife can have a, a gun that kind of looks like your AK-47. Yeah, I so anyway, have the uh, wrong wife then. <laughs> or the right one. <laughs> yeah, that too. Uh, so next up on this... Uh, tour of polymer uh, firearms. Uh, we got the Rock River Arms 1911 Poly. Uh, now this was something that I was very much looking forward to like uh, maybe about two years ago. See after I got my first Rock River AR-15 and then I heard a rumor I started seeing ads that they were going to do 1911s again. You know Rock River uh, actually started out making 1911s and they switched to AR-15s for the most part. The contract work for the uh, for the government was good, but now it seems like you know since they've made a bunch of money, just fistfuls of cash, 
and now they're starting to do 1911s again and kind of broaden out. Um, so they came out with a, a polymer 1911, and, um, you know, I had looked at this a lot, but they didn't offer too much information on that in the past. So now that it's actually available and it has an MSRP, I can talk to you guys about it. So, you know, this is the whole modern twist on a timeless design, uh, five-inch barrel, uh, chrome molly is the construction of the barrel. It's got a polymer frame and mainspring housing, um, and it's got a steel frame insert that that steel slide rides on that insert, but the mainspring housing and the frame is polymer. The trigger is aluminum. Uh, it's got a commander-style hammer, um, and then it's got a beaver grips, beaver tail grip safety, uh, just like everyone's favorite 1911s have. Uh, it's got a parkerized finish, and the grips on the frame are overmold, uh, kind of rubberized, but the classic double diamond shape with the, uh, the diamond, um, I don't know, checkering on there. The front sight, or the, the front and rear sights are dovetail, um, so you can drift those around or change them out for other 1911 dovetail sights. Um, the overall, the gun weighs two pounds, or a little bit over two pounds. So you might be asking yourself, why the heck would I get a polymer uh, hybrid 1911? Well, the weight. If you want to carry it, a full-size five-inch barrel, and have it not pull down your pants, you know, this would be one very popular option. And it's not too crazy, because a lot of 1911 manufacturers now, including Ruger, to that list, are coming out with some of their popular models, but with a like composite alloy, not not to composite, but just like an alloy frame. So yeah, it's not as strong as a steel frame, but it saves in the weight department for carrying. So this is could kind of go along with the same mindset of hey, you're saving ounces, which really um, count when that's on your belt and you're carrying it all day. Yeah, because uh, it looks, it looks you know a standard one weighs about two and a half pounds of standard steel, you know, and a half pounds, <clears throat> excuse me, probably not that much when you're just shooting it at the range, but if you have to carry that extra half pound around for 12 hours, that's going to make a big difference. Yep. I mean, what uh, they, they say in the Army, ounces uh, ounces lead to pain because, right. you know, you got to huff that all, all day long, and you can definitely feel it. Uh, comes with two seven-round magazines, a polymer holster, a mag loader, of course the lock. It does come with a fitted a fitted case and a Rock River warranty. Um, but another big thing is uh, they are offering it in different colors. So you can get a black polymer frame with uh, some flat dark earth grips, a um, flat dark earth frame with black grips, a OD green frame with black grips or a black frame with OD green grips. Um, say that ten times fast. But uh, so, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, you know, I, I'm kind of I like OD and anything. So I, the OD frames kind of neat looking to me. But what I just don't get is why everybody who sells 1911s only includes seven round mags. I mean. Come on, the eight rounders have proven that they've been around long enough. They don't have any problems. Come on, just throw some eight rounders in there. I don't know. It's easier for people to count to seven. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, I mean, there's ten rounders. You know, why don't everyone include ten rounders in their 1911s? They, well, uh, eights are flush fit, just like the sevens. So that's why I don't get that. Yeah. I don't know. It's I don't know more t uh, true to the classic design. Yeah. So I mean, with the other thing uh, that you might be all excited. I got you all worked up. You're you're just busting out your checkbook now. The MSRP <laughs> on these guys are nine hundred and twenty-five dollars. Uh, and no, I'm not dyslexic. I didn't say that backwards. Nine hundred and twenty-five dollars. Is the MSRP so you're looking at what like nine less than a little less than nine street price for a 1911 that has a polymer frame? Uh, you can get steel, very high quality 1911s that have all most of these features and a steel frame. You know, for less than that. I mean, a Ruger SR 1911 
bam, you're there. A Remington R01, you know, you're there. Um, heck, I mean, Rock, Rock Island Armory, I mean, the names go on and on. So why you would introduce something that's supposed to be, like, a little bit cheaper to produce and lighter weight when it's not lighter weight? The only, the only thing that's lightweight about the price is your wallet afterwards. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I exactly. kind of feel like those those numbers should be reversed, so it's 529 MSRP instead of 925. Because then I would be like, man, if I see one, I'm gonna get it. Um, that's just my opinion. I I don't know uh, what their profit margin on these are, um, but I don't think the Rock River Arms name is quite big enough to justify paying nine hundred dollars for a 1911. That's you know polymer framed because yeah. it's just polymer That's... should not be more expensive than a steel alternative now Rock River also has 1911s that are not polymer and that's important that I bring that up too so they have a basic limited a carry a hardball a tactical they've got some bullseye uh, models limited match um, so they're just a basic limited one that's an MSRP of one thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and you know it might look the these pistols. Granted, they do look like they're kind of built more for competition a little bit, just the way the sights are and and how these some of these are titled. You know, limited uh, bullseye. Um, let's see the carry pistol. How much is that? I mean, even the carry is one thousand six hundred fifty dollars. And that just looks like a regular production 1911 that everyone else pushes out. So it maybe it's just their price ranges are way up there. Compared to everything else they offer, 925 is a steal. But compared to the market, I'm not so sure that uh, that's going to fly. Yeah, I'm not keen on the price. I mean, it looks like a good idea, but yeah, for that price, I think I'll buy something else that's steal. I'm not going to yeah. carry a full-size 1911, so... Yeah, I mean, you could even have this, the frame Cerakoted and still come way under, so... Oh, yeah. But, but anyway, if you want to check out those for yourself, you got to go on over to rockriverarms.com and look under the RRA 1911 category under products. So next up, we're going to get into the main discussion, the Firearms Insider panel reviews. So uh, we're going to go ahead and let Chad go first. What did you bring for us this week? Oh, I brought a tank. Oh, wait. It's a range bag. Uh, but it's huge. Uh, actually, it is the Midway USA competition range bag. And I'll hold it up here in a minute, but I'll wait because I got it packed full of stuff and... It's kind of heavy, uh, but what it is is, oh, a while back, my good old duffel bag that I'd been using as a range bag had given up. It started getting too many holes, and I said, you know, I need a real range bag. So I went looking, and I found this one, and I wanted a fairly large one because I don't carry it all the time. I carry it in, and that's about it, and so... I decided to give it a try. It was on sale. It was about the right size. The thing has a zillion pockets. I think they list it as having nine pockets, a uh, bunch of different sized ones. The main compartment has a double zippered, you know, with a little pull thing and Velcro, which is pretty cool. Uh, the One of the cool features about it is, is it comes with two pistol rugs that match the range bag and a little like ammo carrier that sits inside the main compartment. And then it also comes with a little brass bag that you can clip on and off whatever you're doing. And so what I found is you load it up with all your stuff, which consists of, you know, everything you take to the range and maybe even the kitchen sink. It's that big. So I, but you can just put what you need, the ammo and mags and stuff, to, like if you're shooting a match and you're walking from stage to stage, you can just take the little bag out, which I will show you here. And, you know, it's, you know, not huge. And carry it around. It's got some handles. It's padded. It's even got 
zippered pockets inside of it. And then it also has these little Velcro. You can separate it out with these little Velcro padded compartments. So that feature in itself is really cool. And then you don't, you can just leave the range bag in your car, truck, whatever. You don't have to worry about it, you know, carting it around all day. And then I think somewhere over here I have one of the pistol rugs, you know, just your standard everyday pistol rug. And it comes with two of those, which was, I thought, really cool. Now, one of the things I don't care for is these are pretty flimsy. They're not as padded and as nice as, like, one you would go buy. But I figured they threw them in pretty much probably for free, so I'm not complaining. They And then you move on to the main bag here, and I'll see if I can hold it up back here far enough. And then basically... You can see it's pretty good size. You know, it's got this main compartment. I will read the sizes here in a second. Since it is loaded up with targets, ammo, stapler, extra hearing protection, extra eye protection, sunscreen, because, you know, once in a while it does actually get sunny here. Uh, but got tools in it, so... It will store about anything. Uh, let's see. I'll read some info on it. I'm not going to hold it up again because it's too heavy. Uh, I'll basically read the claim to fame. It's a large range bag with lots of pockets. Uh, it's basically for anybody looking for a huge range bag. Uh, it is 22 inches long. Uh, it's 15 inches wide, which it's actually quite a bit wider when you pack it full of stuff. Uh, it's 10 inches high. The main compartment is 17 by 10 inches by 10 inches, so the full height. And that's where they, there's two slots in the side to hold the pistol rugs. And then you can also put that little ammo bag or whatever in there also. Uh, and then it has a... On the front, or what they call the front, it has two padded zipper pockets that are 8 by 8 by 2 inches deep. And then the rear pocket is an 8 by 2 by 16, which has eight built-in magazine pouches and a bunch of little, like, elastic ones for, they say, like, cleaning tools and stuff like that. I actually use that compartment to put the targets and stapler, and then I put pens and stuff I might need to write in that. I don't actually usually use it for magazines, but it's there if you need it. <laughs> the left pocket is 4 inches by 2 inches by 8 inches, uh, and then there's a bottle holder on that side, which... You can hold a little bottle of water or whatever. Uh, on the right side, it's got an 8x2x8 eight by eight pocket, which I usually store extra hearing protections in that one. Uh, it's got a padded shoulder strap that's removable with little clasps. Uh, it's got carry handles with hook and loop closure, if that actually matters to anybody. Uh, and then the removable storage bag that I explained uh, it's your standard PVC-coated polyester, and they list it as a capacity of 2,404 cubic inches. And so that's pretty good size if you're looking for a range bag. Uh, you can no longer get the multicam, which is what I have. So it comes in black, gray, coyote, which is a tan brown color, and olive drab. Uh, other people are saying... You know, from Midway, there's somebody gave it five of five stars. It says roomy, nice compartments, lots of storage, sturdy, practical, not sure what else you would want in a range bag. And then there's a review over at the Truth About Guns, and they gave it four stars for usability, flexible, practical design with more pockets than I know what to do with. 
They gave it five stars for value. They bought theirs for 45 on sale. And at its normal price of 80 it's still nice. And overall, they gave it a four or a five star. Uh, the four is if you get it on sale, and the five is if you pay, or the five is if you get it on sale, and the four is full price. Uh, they range from forty nine ninety nine to eighty dollars and ninety nine cents, depending on if it's on sale. Uh, right now, I think they're fifty nine ninety nine for any one of the colors. Uh, the only place you can get it is Midway, so it's kind of if you need it now, you kind of have to wait. Uh, for our ratings, the pros, I gave it the price. Uh, mine was on sale, so uh, the number of pockets comes with extra pistol pouches, removable ammunition storage bag, which is really cool, double-stitched zippers, uh, the bag to hold your spent brass in, uh, your padded carry strap, and the built-in magazine pouches. The cons were the flimsy pistol pouches, and once you get everything in it, it is really heavy. <laughs> so I gave it an 8, which is great. So that's pretty much the review on the range bag. Wow, that is a uh, that's like an a well or like a an overly designed range bag. Like that's got everything on it that you would possibly need. Um, yeah, does it that's... The, the zippers? The I'm seeing some kind of like uh, cordage for the zipper pulls. Can you describe that? Yeah, on the main zipper, there's. On the main compartment, there's two zippers with a strap that just goes between them, so you can grab it and pull it back and forth. And then on the other zippers, looking for, yeah, this is probably the best view, is this little, you know, it's just like a little round thing that you can just grab and pull. And I think all the zippers have those except the inside compartment ones, and some of those even have that. So that's kind of cool. They have this little, you know, you can just grab it and pull and don't have to really grab onto anything. Yeah, right on. Uh, it has a little clear window on one end so you can put your name in it if you want. Uh, it does not have molly straps or Velcro on it, so you're kind of, if you want to put patches or something, you are screwed. <laughs> It's gotta have the patches, man. Well, you could you could you could sew some fel some hook and loop, excuse me, on it to put all your patches on. Yeah, there you go. Pretty cool. And that that price is is uh, actually I was not expecting it. I guess it's on sale. You know that sale price is is extremely good, but even at the full retail, that's not bad either. Yeah, and it seems like it's always on sale. If it's yeah. not, wait wait a couple weeks and it'll be on sale. Cool. Yep, and then we get the link for that in the uh, in the show notes if you want to check that out on uh, Midway's website. Yes, and then there's also the link to the review on the Firearms Insider. Yep. So uh, thanks for doing that review. That was uh, very interesting. Um, I just picked up a range bag, and now I'm thinking, crap, I should have got one of those Midway bags. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll do a review on that, and we'll see how it stacks up. Um, so my review today is a uh, baton, the collapsible baton from Smith & Wesson. Um, and so this is the what it looks like. Um, when you collapse these guys... Uh, they're um, very close to the you know law enforcement standard where once you deploy it, it's out, and the only way you can retract it is if you like stab this into the ground, like the ground owes you money. Um, so I can't really do that here without like breaking the glass on the table or putting a hole in the wall. So I'm going to talk a little bit and then show for the camera the baton and the different angles and stuff. And then, uh, then I'll deploy it and talk about it then, but then I'm not going to be able to retract it successfully and record it at the same time. I have to like get out of my chair, walk backwards, stab it into the rug, and hopefully that's enough resistance to, uh, to collapse it. So Smith & Wesson makes uh, tools. They make knives. You might have seen like the M&P knife and a, different, a bunch of different little tools. 
So this is the package that comes in. It says Smith & Wesson uh, Professional Quality Tools. Um, so they make batons that are meant for self-defense. Um, they have three different sizes. You can get a 16-inch baton, and that's the when I say it's the size, I mean when it's fully um, expanded, um, that's the size I'm talking about. So you can get a 16-inch one. You can get a 21-inch one, which is this. And what I did not know, you can get a 26-inch one, um, and that's going to be a little bit more money. So as far as the prices on those, the 26-inch baton you can get for about 50 bucks, 49.99. You can get the 21-inch one for 44.99, basically five bucks less. And then you can get the 16-inch for 39.99. Again, another five bucks. So it seems like if you want to add five inches to the baton, you add five dollars to the price. Um. Anyway, I got the 21-inch. Um, I originally had bought this uh, around Christmas time this last year. I was going to give it to my sister because she does a lot of running um, in the um, Seattle-Tacoma area, um, you know, sometimes in the morning before she has to go to work or at night. Um, and I, you know, she's not really, she, because she's a school teacher and just the, the kind of lifestyle she leads, she's a little bit different than I am. Um, she's not really, and she likes guns, she's got no problem with guns, but she's not really interested in owning a gun and getting a concealed carry permit. So uh, I can't get her to carry a gun, um, obviously, and I can't, we got her pepper spray before, you know, for like if she's running and like a dog comes after her or something like that. Um, but she doesn't carry it with her at all for whatever reason. Um, so I thought I'd get her a baton and uh, maybe she might want to carry that around or at least have it with her in her vehicle if something were to happen in the parking lot or whatnot. Um, so then I found out that the county she lives in, actually, you it's illegal to have a baton, a bat, a club, um, a concealable pool cue, um, anything that you can use as a bludgeoning device. They do not let you conceal that when you're out in public. Now, you can have it at home, which is fine for home defense, but... Uh, she, if she stuck this in her coat pocket or in her pants pocket or left it in her vehicle, she could potentially get in trouble with law enforcement. So I didn't want to, uh, you know, set her up for that. So I didn't give it to her. I ended up keeping it for myself. Um, so now I can do a review on it. Um, so the 21 inch, the collapsed length is just shy of eight and a half inches. Um, so that's from the tip to the butt end cap. So that might be a little long to stick inside, you know, your, your jeans in your pockets or whatnot, but it's it's just long enough or short enough to fit into maybe like a coat pocket. Uh, it also comes with this nylon sheath um, that you can slide the baton into like so. Um, it does have a, a strap that's got a button on there that interfaces with the mole system. Um, you can also, because it's got uh, some kind of a horizontal straps that you can kind of weave that into. You can also hang this on your belt if you were wanted to do so. Um, so it's kind of nice that it comes with the sheath. Uh, let's see what else. Going through the uh, the pros and the cons, and then on all the uh, the key points here. The claim to fame: it's easier to use and less conspicuous than a bulky nightstick. The Smith & Wesson heat-treated collapsible baton provides an easy-to-use threat deterrent with a flick of the wrist. The target market is obviously civilians where legal where you're allowed to have a baton um, and law enforcement slash security, anyone concerned with self-defense. Now you might have, uh, if you're law enforcement, you know, your department probably has much more robust batons. You know, they're maybe a little bit thicker. I mean, they're probably literally almost bulletproof or bombproof. Um, and I did check those out at a law enforcement tactical supply store, but the shortest one was 99 bucks, almost 100 bucks for like a 9-inch one, little tiny one. I thought it was a Kubaton. It's pretty much just the length of it. And if you wanted the longer ones, I think like 14 to 16 was getting up to $200. So... Um, Obviously, I didn't want to go that route, um, but then I realized that Smith & Wesson makes these for under 50 bucks. So for this 21-inch version, I'm only in uh, $44, uh, 45 bucks. 
Uh, the features and benefits, the grip itself is, they call it a thermoplastic polyester elastolomer, um, but I pretty much just call it rubberized because that's what it is. It feels rubberized. It's got a basket weave texture, and it's got these raised tread, um, almost like pill-shaped, uh, and they're, they're really aggressive. Um, so this thing really is tacky in your hands. And I've also, like, you know, dunked it in water and also held it. And it's still very tacky, even when wet. So that's a huge benefit to the grip that they used. Uh, the tensile strength, they rated as 6,638.78 um, foot-pounds. And then the bending strength is 4,055.84 foot-pounds. Uh, it's constructed out of uh, 4130 seamless alloy steel tubing, and it's got a hardness of 46 to 47. So they are only available in black, and I told you those three lengths, 16, 21, and 26 inches. Uh, what others are saying, um, so I, I bought this from Bass Pro Shops. I got some Bass Pro gift cards during Christmas and trying to find what I can use those cards on. I ended up buying the baton. Um, so this review comes from Bass Pro Shop's website. He says, uh, the title of the review is Vulgar Display of Awesome, which is like the best band name I've ever heard. Uh, he says, advantages, it's easy to use, uh, durability, performs well, value for the money, and quality. These are made very well, grip is perfect, weight is hefty, action is solid. These are not for your Halloween costume unless you plan on being attacked. I guarantee this will deter just about any attack or put said attacker in touch with reality. First thing I did was flick it all the way out, and I'm very satisfied. Very. Uh, so then the second review is from LA Police Gear. Uh, it says, okay for the price, the baton fits way too tight in the sheath for any kind of quick draw. After about two months of service, the seam on the belt loop of the sheath busted off on the job, so I had to carry the baton in my pocket. Not much later, while closing the baton, like usual, striking perpendicular to the ground, the tip busted off. For all intents and purposes, it is still serviceable, but if I could do it all over again, I would have spent the extra money for a quality-built, reliable piece of gear from ASP. That's a competitor, or a baton maker. Um, so what that reviewer mentioned is actually one of my negatives, too, is this aggressive tread they've, they've added to this grip um, really kind of clings to the nylon of the sheath so there's quite a bit of resistance almost like a tearing when you're pulling it out as the lip of this nylon sheath the seam catches each one of those treads as you pull it out so actually when you pull it out there's one two three four five six uh, points where it kind of oh it doesn't catch the first one so five points where it catches as you pull it so I don't know if that'll wear over time. I assume that eventually, like if I literally just sheath and unsheath this thing, like I was churning butter, the uh, rubber might wear down or, or the edges might round out enough to where it doesn't do that anymore. Uh, but that's just something to keep in notice. If you want this to be quickly accessible and quickly deployable, I would not keep it in the sheath. I'd just put it in your pocket or figure out some other system. Uh, so if you need it now, it's available from several online retailers, Bass Pro Shops, Midway USA, Cabela's, um, LA Police Gear, and most other local gun shops or outdoor stores, law enforcement supply stores, that sort of thing. Uh, so for my rating, I gave it a 7.0, and the pros, the weight and diameter are a little less than the other law enforcement uh, grade batons. And so the price is a little bit less, but I felt like I intended to buy this for a, a female that could put this in her purse or um, somehow carry it on her person. So I didn't want something that was huge. I didn't want it to feel like she was carrying a rolling pin with her. Um, the grip texture is very tacky even when wet. That's a great feature. Um, the included sheath has this uh, mole strap if you wanted to put this onto a tactical vest or put it onto a bug out bag. Um, you could do that. I would just put in the disclaimer that you're not going to pull this out of the holster or the sheath really quickly when you're using it, unless you have like a, a different kind of sheath made, you know, something that's leather perhaps. 
Um, when extended properly, <clears throat> it's very solid. And I say that because part of the cons is if you do not extend it with enough force so that the raw, the tubes really lock up, um, you're going to swing it around and then it's going to collapse by one tube length. And so it'll kind of be a little hokey. Then again, you can you know, snap your wrist again and it should extend, but you really have to extend it with authority in order to get it to like lock up that friction. And of course, over time, the more you're playing with this thing and extending the, the baton, you know, you're going to start to wear the paint on that those tubes and the friction is going to be a little bit less. And so that might be something over time that I'd be worried about versus a $200 um, law enforcement grade model that, you know, let's face it, if you're law enforcement, you know, your uh, department's got a PO number that they can buy the nice batons for. So I wouldn't recommend getting this for uh, professionals, but for just civilians that aren't going to be um, using it, kind of more of a, you might use it twice in your life or just whip it out and scare somebody off. Uh, it works fine for that, but it's not like a Halloween costume toy like that other you mentioned. Uh, the other cons I gave it, uh, the there's no lanyard. There's no place for you to put a lanyard to wrap this around your wrist so that it can't, you can't be disarmed or you can't drop it. Um, and then the, uh, so you can unscrew the end cap here and actually uh, it'll come out with all the tubes. So you'll see that it's, uh, yeah, I got the handle here and it's hollow. So how it works is this is the end cap and it's got kind of this retaining clip. And the retaining clip kind of uh, goes right into the end of this the smaller tube. So when it's collapsed, you know, everything's kind of being held together just with a little bit of friction from that clip. And then when you extend, you know, the taper of the tubes, you know, the friction really, when you, they're fully outstretched, locks in, and you get like a nice solid uh, baton, you know, club. So now that I've mentioned all that and you've seen it, there's pictures on the website of it collapsed. Um, I'm going to actually extend it for you so you can see that. I'm going to make sure not to break the mic or the uh, the video camera. But it just takes a quick flick of the wrist so then it's fully extended. Uh, so this is the, I guess what you call the end cap on the front. Um, this is when you want to collapse it. This is what you just stab into the ground, you know, and it's got to be like cement. I probably wouldn't do this on your hardwood floor. Um, you could maybe do it on your carpet if you've got a hard enough flooring underneath the carpet. Um, but obviously, when you want to collapse this thing, I mean, you got to, like, stab into a very hard surface in order for it to kind of uh, force those tubes back into each other. And perfect. As you can see, just with my hand, I didn't flick it out hard enough with enough authority. So now with my hand, I can contract that first tube. So now I'm left with this little thing. Um, so you really have to uh, fling it out really hard. I mean, maybe from this position I don't have enough leverage uh, to physically... See, I even closed it with one hand. You shouldn't be able to do that. So that means I really didn't fling it hard enough. I'll try it one more time. There, see, now I can't collapse it with my hands. Um, so... That being said, when you have a baton like this, primarily the first defense is um, it's very threatening. It's very uh, when if someone's like, "Hey, give me your purse," or you know they won't back off. If you pull this out of your pocket and you flip this dude out, it's kind of the universal symbol for your you're you're asking for a can of whoop ass, sir. Will you please step back now? Um, you know, you've got to make sure that you fling that thing out hard if, like, because you might just have to use it and you do not want to do what it just did a couple minutes ago when you're actually going to be in a fight. Um, but that being said, there's lots of reviews of people saying that they've used this and gone around and in their backyard beat the crap out of a bunch of inanimate objects um, and it seemed to hold up pretty good. Um, you know, that one review about it being them, if you're not stabbing it, like directly perpendicular, you may be at an angle, perhaps that force is enough to start to damage this end cap. I do have some, uh, some of the edges starting to chip a little bit from me doing that, so just keep that in mind. So uh, I, I would definitely still use this for self-defense, 
but I definitely have playing with it and, and not really using it for defense. I see some of the weaknesses in it, and so I got to keep that in mind. If I'm, you know, if there's a druggie that's, you know, trying to to mug me, I really got to fling this thing out there and show them that I mean it, and hopefully I don't have to use it. But if I do, if I've used enough authority to um, extend it, I know that I could use this to uh, manipulate the situation and 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 get away. Um, without really uh, causing harm to myself or, you know, defending myself from harm. So that's pretty much my review. Uh, you can find these at most, you know, military surplus stores. Sometimes they carry these. Um, big box stores, Sportsman's Warehouse, Cabela's, things like that. Um, just keep in mind that it's not a law enforcement baton. It's kind of like a little bit of a downgrade version but it's a step up from a prop for a, you know, Halloween sexy cop costume. So uh, just just keep that in mind, folks. That's all I'm trying to say. I don't think I have any questions for you on that. Not even gonna ask me how many uh, how many something about the sexy cop costume. No, no, que no questions no, on that. No. Pretty self-explanatory. I'm not gonna ask about that. Okay. Probably for the best. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I don't want Jake to get too mad at us. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's get into the uh, the tech gadget or app. Um, and this week, actually, uh, I found something a little bit interesting that I know a lot of you guys... I've been talking about Tracking Point in this segment of the podcast because it, Tracking Point's product kind of perfectly slips into what the tech gadget or app segment is supposed to entail. Something highly technological uh, that, that brings the firearm to another plane of, of functionality um, and use. Now, the, the tracking point stuff is really expensive and much out of the realm of the civilian, you know, that doesn't make 200 grand a year. So, um, that said, uh, Remington has came out with a digital optics system that is kind of powered by, partnered with, um, influenced by Tracking Point. Like it literally has the Tracking Point logo small in on the, the scope itself. So they call this the Remington 2020. Of course, 2020 is what you would say for having a very good quality of vision. Um, so the 2020 is a uh, digital optic system. Um, you know, they've got a lot of flowery language on here. It says it's the only digital optic system that lets you see the future. Um, so I'm going to just skip past right all that BS because uh, you know, Remington's got some black eyes right now. And, uh, you know, coming to the market with a digital scope, um, it, it's, it's kind of hard. I, I guess they can they they can market it with every last penny they have, and it's still not going to really uh, you know sell itself. So I'm I'm going to try and tell you exactly what you're looking at here, and and hopefully it'll do a better job uh, convincing you this is going to be um, useful than just reading their marketing materials. Uh, that said, Remington's website, the shoot2020.com, shoot2020. Com, uh, is kind of their product specific page for the 2020 scope and they actually did a really good job of making a interactive virtual tour of the scope. Uh, first you're looking at it on their Remington 700 um, and then when you click on the next arrow it kind of gives you a zoom in and then the scope, ro the whole rifle rotates so it kind of shows you the three quarter view of the scope and so then it tells you the integrated components. So it's a three. It's a, a um, three power to twenty one uh, scope. It's got a laser range finder on board that's capable to seven hundred and fifty yards. Uh, on it, just like its tracking point um, that it's, I guess, trying to imitate. Uh, it's got an advanced ballistics calculator. It's got video and audio recording on it, and it's got its own Wi-Fi server. So it allows you to range your target and then you can plug in the load that you have if you're shooting. Um, they, they kind of, they offer this on rifles, 
I don't know if you can buy the scope separately yet. Um, so that's something that you might have to, if you're not interested in buying a new Remington gun, I don't think you can get the scope separately quite yet. Um, they have it for the Remington 700 long range, I believe in 30 out six, and they have it comes with a uh, on a Remington 700 SPS tactical in 308, you know, kind of the, the shorter bull barrels with the hoe stock, and then it also comes on an AR-15, like the uh, I forget what it's called, like the R-15 or something. It's yeah, it's the Bushmaster Varmeter. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, so the price is going to fluctuate between which one of those rifles you want to come with. So the, the, the price tag I'm about to tell you, it might make you drop your jaw a little bit, but keep in mind that comes with the gun. Um, so we're looking at a range between $5,500 to um, about $5,575. So depending on which one of those rifle platforms you want, the the, the 700 long range, the 700 short action on the the SPS, or the uh, on the Bush Bushmaster Varminder, you know you're looking at that range of you know 75 bucks, 5,500 5, or 5,575 bucks. Um, I think I read somewhere that you might be able to get the. It's rumored that getting the optics standalone. Probably be about three thousand dollars, four thousand dollars, somewhere in there. So obviously, how this differs from tracking point is it doesn't interface with the firearm that it's mounted to at all. Um, so there's nothing to, you know, nothing that goes to the trigger, so that you like an actual tracking point. You hold down the trigger, and you just kind of hover your crosshairs over your tag that you've made, and then it'll go off automatically. Doesn't do any of that. What it does do is, uh, you know, the reticle, once you've tagged your target with the, the button on top of the scope, and then it ranges it as you, ta- as you have tagged it. Um, and then it'll automatically, when you have programs, say you're shooting 30 out 6, and you're shooting 175 grand Sierra Match Kings, actually, it would be Game Kings if you're trying to um, shoot an animal. Um, so then once you have all that information plugged in, it's got the wind on there. You have to, uh, you can mount some kind of, uh, I guess if you had like a Kestrel wind meter or you knew how to look at the grass and tell, estimate the windage, there's like a little rocker on the top of the scope that you toggle to change the wind. So, you know, you can toggle it and go like five miles per hour, you know, right or left, whichever direction you're facing, east, west, whatever. So basically it sets your windage by doing that manually. Uh, if you've tracked, if you've tagged an animal and that animal is moving, supposedly it will, there's an advanced movers mode and it'll actually tell you how fast the animal is moving too, if the animal's running at 10 miles an hour or whatnot. Um, so then there's, uh, like if you're recording video, there's a video memory time and recording on indicator, your Wi-Fi indicator with bars. I mean, this HUD, this heads-up display has a lot of information on it. Um, it's got temperature and barometer pressure on there, uh, battery condition and um, battery percentage left, uh, you, obviously your zoom level. It even has rifle cant, read by internal gyroscopic sensors. So kind of on the bottom, it almost looks like a, uh, a compass, or if you're on a, I guess like if you're flying a plane, you know, it shows you if, you're, if your wings are parallel with the ground. It's kind of like that. So if you're, you know, kind of set up on a hill, it tells you how much you're canting. Now, supposedly the scope is taking all that information for you. So when you tag the animal, first and it you know brings down obviously your reticle because it's adjusting for how much you have to lift that muzzle up um, supposedly it takes the cant the wind and everything that you've put you've put in the wind but it's automatically reading the cant and you've put in the ammunition and it knows the feet per second and the ballistic coefficient so it's basically going to put that crosshair where it needs to go in order to get that bullet to drop on that tag um, now, if you're shooting an animal, an elk, you need to make sure you tag it in the right spot. Um, so you, you want to zoom in and tag it on the vitals. You don't want to tag it on the ass necessarily because 
when it does all this math and dope, when you it, the shot is, it thinks that you want to put a, a bullet right in the elk's ass or butt. I don't know if I can say ass on the podcast. I did twice. So um, that's something as a hunter I'm kind of ethically concerned about because an elk might be standing broadside one second later it's turned three quarters or it's facing right at you. Your tag is useless then that you've set on that animal. This is really more advantageous for an animal that's feeding broadside and ain't moving and doesn't move the entire time until you shoot it. Um, you know, I'm kind of concerned of what happens to your tag when the animal switches directions or quarters away or, or you know, goes behind cover and comes back out or if another elk passes in front of it. There's so many variables that this is great for shooting steel at range, um, but... I don't know about shooting elk or, or any kind of big game animal with this technology. Coyote, okay, a 30 out 6 you hit a coyote anywhere. Um, it might not be ethical, but if you hit a coyote in the rear with a 30 out 6 it's not going too far. You, you've, you've got it. You, you get some extended trigger time on that animal. But I don't know. They're, they're showing a lot of pictures of this in the field on big game animals, and that's kind of where I'm kind of interjecting some of my, like, uh, skepticism on that. Um, so anyway. Yeah. I was I was wondering, you know, if it's standing broadside and you tag it, you know, in its lungs, heart area, you know, if it turns away from you, is it going to know that that spot is, you know, is it going to actually track the spot? I don't see how it could do that like you were saying. You know, you, I guess you could just always re-tag it. It's just a push button, I guess. So. Yeah, yeah I guess that's that's going to be what you have to do is just re-tag it if it adjusts position, which is going to be frustrating in the field if that elk is, you know, in, in the rut and he's chasing another cow and he won't hold still and, and they keep, you know, kind of serpentine, changing positions. That's going to be frustrating. Um so anyway, the the system that they have, they call it tag track react. So um, obviously tag is where you align the dot in the HUD with the target, press the tag button on the top of the scope, and it locks a digital tag on the target up to 500 yards away. Now it said previously that the range finder had a, a range of 750 yards. The tag looks like it's only good for 500 yards. Now, uh, track the ballistic computer calculates a firing solution for all the factors impacting the shot, and the blue reticle simultaneously offsets to indicate actual point of impact for that shot. So if you're, the wind's blowing, you've set a 10-mile-per-hour wind coming from left to right, you're kind of on the side hill, so your rifle's canted, you know, you've got your, your load data worked in there, or if you bought... Remington bullets that they suggest you buy some of their like core lock stuff um, you know they already know uh, the performance of that round um, so then you know I guess the the firing solution is updated 54 times per second so that allows really fast computing and uh, accurate even on moving targets um, and so then react is when the blue reticle is aligned with the tag or aligned with the proper uh, point of aim versus point of impact, it'll turn red, indicating that, okay, you, you can pull the trigger now, and it's supposed to go where it's supposed to go. You know what I see that doing? I, I see that people are going to start jerking the trigger when it turns red and maybe miss yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of why tracking point has it integrated in with the firearm. So you're holding down the trigger, and it's blue, and when you're hovering the scope over your tag, when the crosshairs line up with that tag just right, it takes the human element out of it. It shoots. As long as you've got the trigger pulled, it fires for you. It's kind of like you know, you're flying an F F-22 jet, and you've taken the safety off, and, man, it's, it's sending it you know, when it's locked on there. So... Um, you know, yeah, when it turns red, that yeah, might be okay to shoot, but, you know, half a second later, it could go back to blue, and maybe you missed your shot. Um, so anyway, we've talked about the aiming things. You know, it, it'd be great for stationary steel targets, maybe even some rock chucks or uh, groundhogs 
Furmans that like to stand up and hold still for you know five to ten seconds at a time. This would be fun for that if you could be fast enough on it. Now the recording and streaming is kind of cool because it's got a built-in mic, so if you guys have buck fever and you're talking like a bunch of yahoos, it's going to pick up all that, so that'll make an interesting home video later on. Um, so then it, it saves the video and the audio to an internal memory, uh, generates an MP4 file, which can be downloaded via Wi-Fi to any tablet or smartphone um, that uses Android or Apple iOS. So that's kind of cool that you can, uh, you know, on the way home from the hunt, you can download it on your, your buddies can download it from their phones. Um, just kind of tap into the scope using the Wi-Fi network that it has. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Or if you don't shoot anything, at least you could review footage of, oh, man, look at that bull, look at that bull, or look at that buck, and, and, and all that. Um, so then you can also stream it to a tablet or smartphone. So... That gives you, much like the tracking point, the ability to have a spotter or a coach or just um, a partner um, when you're out hunting or shooting that can look at what you're looking at on their device. You know, so you know if they've got a spotting scope um, and you're zoomed in all the way, you know, they can kind of communicate with you and be your spotter. You know, like oh, you know, not that bull. You know, aim, you know, this high or this low or whatever. So. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that you can use this smart scope kind of dumb too uh, that you can if the batteries die or uh, obviously it needs the range finding aspect in order to uh, adjust for elevation um, but it'd be nice to not rely on that whole tagging tracking and slapping the trigger when it turns red kind of thing yeah but without it seems like there is no etched reticle, though. I mean, yeah. it looks like it's just whatever is displayed. Yeah. And see, that's like the, the, the Burris Eliminator 3 is kind of a similar system. It's not quite as high-tech advanced. It's a little bit more, I guess, just like it's 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 got a thick bottom post, and it's got like a little dot that kind of moves up and down that line. Um, and then as far as the uh, the windage, you have to kind of do that on your own. Um, but it's got a, a reticle that you could still use uh, without using the, the smart technology. You can zero that thing at 100 yards, 200 yards, and still use it without implementing the electronic functions into that. Um, so all the factors that this scope takes into, this Remington 2020 takes into when it's trying to determine that, that shot, um, obviously the drop in the bullet, temperature, air density, barrel twist and direction, wind drift, bar barometric pressure, the Magnus effect drift, spin drift, incline, decline, target movement, muzzle velocity, cant, and of course our favorite effect, the Coriolis effect, which is the whole earth spinning. Um, so then it also takes into factors like lock time, ignition time, and barrel time. So when you buy the scope on the rifle, you know, this one of those Remington 700s or the AR-15, it's kind of configured to already know those tiny, tiny lock time, ignition time, barrel time of the projectile. So I don't know how much that plays into the ballistics of it, but it's kind of nice that... You know, when you buy the rifle with the scope, it's kind of in tune to each other. Or as far as the scope's in tune to the rifle, as far as the rifle goes, Remington's quality control, I'm not quite sure I can guarantee what that rifle's tuned into. I assume that because you're spending over five grand on a rifle that you can buy bone stock for six, seven hundred dollars, probably, maybe eight, uh, that you know, that at least goes through quality control a couple different times. Um, I don't know. I'm not very happy. I've, I bought a Remington 700 recently that uh, the uh, the ejector was kind of goofy. So it actually it was getting hung up on the uh, the case, and so it wasn't feeding right. And so once I, I had it fixed, and then it was no longer, it wasn't ejecting either. So um, I'm getting a new ejector from Remington for that. So uh, if you hear bias undertones coming out in my voice. That's where that's coming from. Uh, but anyway, back to the scope once again. 
you know, it's got internal hardware, it's got a microphone, ballistic calculator, um, zoom controls, environmental sensors for all those pressures and whatnot, a compass, um, you know, it's got a low light cut filter for shooting at dawn and dusk, uh, it's got that Wi-Fi server, integrated range finder, um, it's got a lot of stuff under the hood. As far as the software goes, um, there's a couple apps that you can download on your phones. There's the Remington 2020 app, and then it looks like it'll also use the Shot View app from Tracking Point. So that's really cool that it um, can use the same software as Tracking Point, but at a fraction of the cost because Tracking Point's, God, I don't even know how much those are, like fourteen grand to $20,000. Uh, yeah, I was thinking. This is, yeah, this, this, this pales in comparison to an actual Tracking Point. Yeah, it is powered by Tracking Point. So it's, it gives us guys that don't have a, a, a military point of, um, you know, PO number to just spend on ridiculous um, R&D, high-tech shit stuff. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to, to play around with it. I, I still don't... I, it's definitely outside my price range, but this could be just right for a guy that, that wants to get into this technology and see how it's, how it's used. Um... Yeah. Do you, you have anything to add to that, Chad? Uh, no. Uh, maybe wow. Uh, like you said, the price range is still pretty steep, but, you know, I can see how, you know, stuff always starts out expensive, like the tracking point and this, and in, you know, 10 years, is this going to be, you know, five, 600 bucks, you know, for this technology? Right. I mean, you know, we all paid a lot of money for cell phones back when they first came out, and, you know, look how much they are. They're almost giving them away now. So technology definitely gets cheaper as, you know, time goes on. Uh, my big thing is if you're going to be spending that much, even $5,000 on a scope optic, a digital scope and rifle system, and you're only limited to 500 yards, 600. You know the rangefinder supposedly goes out to 750, um, but the the compensating on the the scope is only good for 500. I can shoot 500 yards all day long with nothing fancy. You know I got a 308. They got steel set up about 485, 500 yards. You hit it all day long. Like it's not that difficult. You just do your homework. Know how many. If you've got a BDC reticle, where's the 500 at? You know, if you've got MOA, know how many minutes of angle your bullet's dropping in 500 yards. It's not hard. Even and if I know you, there's a lot of guys. Even Go if ahead. you're brand new to it, you know, don't buy this. Buy, you know, like you said, you know, get a decent 308 rifle and a decent scope, and you know, spend the money to have somebody train you how to actually shoot it because you know. The batteries aren't going to die in a normal reticle scope. Right, and, and it's sort of like uh, sh you're kind of doing a disservice to yourself because, you know, if you're brand new to shooting a long gun, you need to learn all that because th this is just going to be a crutch for you. I mean, maybe when you're older, you know, you've shot some matches back in your day, you built custom rifles back in your day, but now you're old, you're stubborn, you're, and let's face it, you're kind of lazy, and you just want something cool that works and that you can brag about, and it's kind of more like a, a, a head-turner at the range. Um, you just described me. <laughs> oh, man. But are you rich, though? No, I'm not if rich. You are, if you are, I need to go down to... Uh, I need to make a road trip. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not rich. Okay. So I'm just pulling up my ballistic calculator on my phone here. I've got my Remington 700 AAC SD, which is a 308. It looks to be somewhat close to, I think maybe, mine's a 20-inch. Maybe there, I think theirs might be the 18-inch model. Um, and I'm just going to plug in uh, my best load, 100, Sierra 168 grain uh, Match Kings. You know, you can buy that bullet in Federal Premium right off the, the store shelf if they have it. Um, so I got all my data in here, my altitude, all that. I'll just hit Calculate. Now, 500 yards, my bullet is uh, dropping 
61.1 inches, and that equates to 11.7 minutes of angle. I have a, a scope that's got MOA subtensions that go all the way out to 20. So I've got a pretty good idea of exactly where to hold to hit my target. And like I said, 500 yards, I can hit that every, um, probably four to five times, eight out of ten times. I'm being humble. You're trying to be real with you guys. It's not impossible. So a system that's this, that's this expensive, I would have tried to beef it up so it can reach a thousand yards. You know, a lot of guys, you know, when they're spending a lot of money on custom actions and having them blueprinted and having, you know, tr having them trued, getting really nice, high quality glass on there, freaking two thousand dollar night four scope on there, so they can hit a thousand yards. That seems to be like a good cap. Like, you know, guys want to hit a thousand yards. That should have been what this scope was focused on. The guys that have the money that are interested in, you know, maybe that shortcut to get to a thousand yards and, and, and hit effectively. You know, those same guys that have that money, they've already got budget builds that they've got lying around in their gun safe that can hit four or five, six hundred yards, no problem. So I don't know. I mean that's that's just my opinion on that. Uh, it's really if if it came down on price at, for 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 and it had that 500 yard cap. Okay, I understand. You know, maybe two thousand dollars, twenty five hundred dollars, five hundred yard cap. You want to step up to a thousand yards. You're going to need to pay five thousand dollars, five hundred and fifty uh, for five thousand five hundred dollars. Um, not just you know the way this is set up. I it doesn't make much sense to me. You know, you you could take long-range shooting courses and learn to shoot 500 yards better with your rifle, with your optic, with your freaking cheap Tasco $40 scope, you could learn to shoot 500 yards. Uh, you might have to do some Kentucky windage, but you could do it. So that's that's what I got to say about that. Yeah, that's, that's about it here too. Yeah. Now, if Remington wanted to have send me one to try out sure I would try it out because it, it for me it'd be a novelty it'd be fun to try and see how that technology works um, you know those odd ranges where you know you got to pull out your range finder is it you know I look at it and I think it's 550 but it's 580 and I'm really trying to stress minute of angle accuracy um, you know that would come in handy for you know shooting things that you need to have the range split second right then and there um, and then not have to you know do your your turret adjustment or you know use your come ups on your reticle um, but anyway I've, I've I've talked about enough about that uh, so we don't have any listener feedback this week uh, as always listen to all the other shows on the firearms radio network uh, we've got some awesome shows on the network that cover all sorts of things um, we're talking, or this week, I'm still plugging the This Week in Guns podcast. This podcast is great for if you're busy, you're working, you don't have time to catch up on the news, uh, you know, going to the blogs and seeing, you know, what new gun came out, what, you know, self-defense shooting that was high profile happened, you know, what are, you know, nannies and mayors trying to do now to take away my gun rights. Uh, that kind of firearms-related news is covered each week in This Week in Guns. You could literally sit down on Saturday or Sunday, download the podcast, and, and catch up on whatever happened that week. Um, and then you can do that the next week and the next week. So it's really nice to do. Um, it also helps if you pay attention to a lot of stuff, and then you listen to it, you know, then you're a little bit more better informed what they're speaking for, they're speaking about. Um, so if you want to listen to that, go to www.thisweekendguns.com to uh, download, listen, and subscribe to that podcast. Uh, make sure you send any questions or comments or feedback to podcast at firearmsinsider.tv or cross at firearmsradio.tv. Uh, whoever subscribed podcast at firearmsinsider.tv to spam, uh, not cool. <laughs> That's getting like hit with like some, uh, was it like uh, cat fancy or, or some spam like that? Anyway unsubscribed. Um, remember to uh, go on to iTunes and leave this podcast a review. 
especially we'll be doing some giveaways in the future. Um, I'm trying to come up with a really awesome uh, um, prize to give away for the next iTunes review contest that we do. I think after this Facebook contest, I should have figured out something really cool by then. So I'm going to really try and step it up. The last thing we gave away, I think, was that uh, Negrini handgun case. And that was a really nice handgun case. But I think I want to do something that's on the same level of equally cool, like not just stickers in the mail, but like, wow, I could actually win something awesome. Um, so there you go. Uh, check out all the other shows on the Firearms Radio Network by going to firearmsradio.tv slash iTunes. And remember to visit the Firearms Insider website, firearmsinsider.tv, for the reviews we talked about today, previous reviews, future reviews, and also industry coverage for like Chat Show, NRA Show, things like that. Uh, so once again, Chad, brother, thank you for joining me this week. It was really great to uh, have some of your input on these uh, these items. Yeah, anytime. You know I'm pretty much free most of the time, and it's a lot of fun, so I enjoy it. Thanks for having me again. I appreciate having you on, and uh, everyone else, have a great week. Uh, if you go shooting, shoot safe, and I will catch you on the next episode. Have a good night.